Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for the Making Progress channel. Today, video number 27 in controversial issues, very controversial, is put criminals in jail for longer. I think we should put criminals in jail for much longer. Hot take, Dr. Mike, Mr. Mike, I don't have a PhD in any of this. Explain. Nine subpoints to hit today. First, we're going to talk about what kind of crime is prison worthy in my view, just in my personal view, but don't worry, it's logical. Next, we're going to ask about how to reduce crime. After that, we have to ask the question of why do people commit especially serious crimes? What is the primary function of imprisonment? So you have to think of if we want more people imprisoned, what, what are we getting? Like, what, what is the point of putting people in prison? Seemingly, they just sit in a room. Like, is that really a good thing? Why criminal removal from the population, from population to prison, actually works so well? The value of escalating terms for repeat offenders. What should the prison experience be like? Because I do have some weird stuff to say that probably no one will agree with me on. Yay. The drawbacks to this kind of approach and the main thrust kind of recapitulated to really push the point at the end. So what kind of crime do I think is bad? Because not all crime in my view is bad or definitely not equally bad or definitely not equally worthy of imprisoning the criminals. The kind of crime that I think is really bad that I think it's really good for people like this to go to prison for a long time is the manipulation of property not consented to. Because people own themselves, we have individual liberties in most of the free world, that also counts any assault, any sexual assault, any murder is covered. So all property crime, all theft, and all hurt to actual humans. This is the kind of crime I think people should be in prison for, for a few reasons. One, because this kind of crime makes people's lives much worse, palpably worse, in a way that's not very open to interpretation. So for example, in Greece, just to pick on the Greeks, the degree of government corruption is actually quite high. Some under the table stuff, a little you, little me, quid pro quo, that sort of shit. But Greece has a very low level of violent crime, property crime, theft, sexual assault, etc. The generally people who live in Greece, you'll talk to them about the corruption of the government at various levels, especially the local level. And they're like, ah, yeah, it sucks. You know, we all pay for it one way or another. And you're like, yeah, I got you. Are you leaving? Are you going to move from Greece? Like, ah, I love it here. What, are you serious? But if they had high levels of crime, 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 for real, for real crime, no, look, all that is actually crime. It's actually bad. But specifically physical crime, people hurting you, people taking your stuff, people burning your stuff, people leave real quick. They do not stay around in places voluntarily that have high levels of crime like that. Crime like that, property damage, damage to real physical humans, degrades the standard of livings on almost every metric. Paint me a good picture of a future society which has advanced medicine, advanced housing and healthcare and all that stuff, but in which the physical crime rate is incredibly high. It's a non-starter. It doesn't make any sense. On the other hand, give me a place that has a lot of serious crime of this sort. Let's pick on one, the favelas in metropolitan Brazilian areas. And I nearly guarantee you it's a place where people want to leave much more than get in. How many people move into the favelas willingly? Like they're from the, from the country and they're used to starving to death, maybe, but if they can, they get the fuck out as soon as they can. So this is the kind of crime that's really bad. Versus people who live in Switzerland, Swiss banks are full of like terrorist money and kinds of crazy criminals and their underground organizations keep money there. So technically, there's kind of a lot of crime in that sense in Switzerland. Who is leaving Switzerland and running because of that? Almost no one. It is, again, a non sequitur. So this is the real for real for real kind of crime in the real world that we really care about the most and we want the least of. It is the most destructive and deleterious compared to all other kinds of crime. Now, on this side, we have the real bad crime, sexual assault, assault, theft of property, destruction. We have, you know, a white collar crime somewhere in the middle here. And at the very end, we have this last category of crime, which I, think, I just think shouldn't be a crime in most cases. And that is a subcategory of crime called consensual crime. And a libertarian scholar back a few decades actually came up with this term, I believe, and, and I had a, whole, had a whole book about it. 
Um, and consensual crimes are interactions in which both parties approve of that interaction, but some third party of usually Karens does not, so they write laws to prevent it. An example of this is drug use, drug sale, and prostitution. This is the kind of crime I think most people should not be imprisoned for, almost ever. Because this kind of crime doesn't harm third parties and might not even harm the individuals themselves. By the way, if you want to have laws that prevent harming of individuals themselves by their own consent, you're jumping onto a staircase which ends in totalitarianism. Because if you really think we should be keeping people away from drugs for their own good, you need to realize that keeping people away from fast food for their own good is actually a much bigger pro-human thing that you can do because way more people die of fast food excessive intake per year. It's actually physically worse for them than die of overdoses of marijuana, for which that doesn't even seem like a thing that you can say that makes any sense. And so if you're willing to have people get caught with McDonald's and the cops rip it out of their hands and put them in jail, like you're going to harm yourself again, Susan, you can't eat this crap. If you want to live in that world, dope, live it the fuck away from me and the rest of us who think personal freedoms are kind of sweet. And remember, be careful about saying personal freedoms are not sweet because the ultimate easy, super easy rhetorical retort to that is to pick one of your personal freedoms and pretend that it's now illegal. It's real easy to say other people shouldn't be acting in a certain way that doesn't harm you directly at all. It's tough to say when you're doing some shit. Like, let's say, you know, your Coke bottle thick glasses leftist Karen and you think drugs should be legal or right wing psychotic family Karen and you think drugs should be legal. And we tell you, you know, in our society, we're going to make two things illegal, drugs and uh, the voicing of ostentatious and annoying political opinions. We think that's really deleterious to the community fabric. Karen's like, wait, 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 I do that all the time. Yep, now you got to shut the fuck up or you're going to go to jail. She's like, but I'm just voicing my opinions. So you're saying it doesn't hurt anyone else. Like, yeah, that's how the hell does drugs or prostitution hurt anyone else? They do hurt other people. And I'll tell you how they do in just a second. Absolutely. Places which have a crap load of prostitution and a crap load of drug dealing and drug using can have other bad things. They can have other crimes around that are actually the bad crimes. Drug addicts tend to stab people for money or leave needles in the street or take dumps in the street. Prostitution gets involved with pimping and it's got sex trade and violence and all this other crazy shit. But that's the bad stuff. It is very possible to have prostitution with pretty much none of the bad stuff if you just enforce the bad stuff and prostitution is legal. Sounds nuts, I know. Canberra, Australia. Essentially, no crime. Anyone watching this from the United States or from England, they got no crime compared to the rest of us. It's a joke. They have legalized prostitution. There are brothels in the capital of all of Australia. They just You go and there are prostitutes there that will service you. It is not related to crime almost at all. Why? Because it's completely legal. And the police, if there's pimping involved and illegal shit and people being beat up, the prostitutes call the police because it's not illegal for them to exist and do their job. And then those pimps get sent to jail for doing the actual bad things, violent things, and there you have it. Next, you say, okay, but drugs, when people use them, they degrade and they start pooping in the street and that's bad. That's totally true. But the vast majority of drug users are actually responsible about it. Marijuana, the debate is over. Marijuana is not even a fucking drug. Get out of my face with that shit. Zero social downsides on the net balance. But, and this is really trippy research if you ever want to look it up, the vast majority of alcohol users, cocaine users, heroin users are people that can keep their shit together. Either they're degenerate in a way that only affects themselves, but they do it in the privacy of their own dilapidated homes. And that's something to target and help them with, but don't send people to prison for that sort of thing because they're not hurting anybody else. And, or they end up just being normal people that on the weekends like to get a little funky. That's most people. The people that can't keep their shit together when they use drugs are often people that drugs or not can't keep their shit together. The drugs may make things worse for them, but that you actually nab them for when they commit the actual crimes. And you can have huge amounts of money spent on trying to reduce drug use to help those specific people that can't handle it. But to put anyone who uses a drug, harming no one but even themselves in many cases, into prison is a little bit of an insane proposition. A 
lot of times people with a lot of or areas with lot high prostitution and drug and drug use are great places to live. In Japan, prostitution is in many cases totally legal. And no one gives a shit. Same in Korea. Where's all the crime? Drug use. Amsterdam. Portugal. Legal drug use in many cases. And in the 90s in Amsterdam, you can get damn near whatever you wanted. There's drugs and hookers on the same street. Amsterdam has functionally zero crime compared to inner cities in the United States, for example. It's just not a situation. So even if we make drugs illegal for systemic effects, let's say like it's a crack, just destroys too many families, it's going to be illegal. It's probably much more fine worthy. You catch someone doing crack, it's a thousand dollar fine versus prison worthy. And if you think about it, people using drugs, they're kind of victims of the drug. Maybe you don't put them to prison for using drugs or for buying drugs. You put them into rehabilitative settings. And if you're a drug dealer, well, you're in it for the money, right? You get caught drug dealing. Maybe you just pay a fine. Maybe it's a really big fine. Like Noriega and all those guys that dealt drugs at a super high level. Dude, I say, fuck trying to kill him or put put him in prison. It's just going to be replaced by someone else. You find out he's dealing drugs, just be like, oh yeah, well, you got 60 billion in cash, 50 billion. You get caught again for drugs, it's the, it's 10 billion. We're just going to come after all of your money. You don't even have to put anyone in prison. Drug dealers are there on a serious level for the money. They're going to be like, oh, fuck that. And no one's going to be going into drug dealing anymore, except for people that are really bad at it, that do it at a way lower level. And there goes your whole drug problem because you're fining people. But if they get to keep their money, even if they go to prison, they'll sit in prison for a while in America and all their money cooks somewhere else. It's just when the money's too big, it's you can't fight it. But if you take their money away, that's a big problem. Should you even be doing that? I don't know. That's a more complex issue. But at the very least, it's just not straightforward that consensual crimes should be crimes. And if you remove yourself from trying to fuck with consensual crimes, you have that much more police resource, jurisdictional resource to fight actual for real, for real crimes where people stuff is messed with or they're hurt in some way or killed. Now, since we all think bad crime is really bad, we have to ask the question of how can we reduce crime? I see a few ways in which we can reduce crime, generally three categories. One is prevention. The other is imprisonment of people who tend to be criminals. And the third is rehabilitation. Let's talk about all three really quick. Prevention can include things like uh, just um, engendering cooperative cultural values in your society. Same team type of stuff. Not a lot of us versus them thinking, a lot of community building, a lot of uniting on social cultural issues, a lot of dialogue. That kind of stuff is great. It's amazing. People on the political left talk about it all the time. It's a great thing. It's the best thing in the world. I love it. That kind of stuff is awesome. You have a lot of this kind of culture in like Korea and Japan, for example. People on Japan will run to give you your wallet that you dropped on the train just because they're same team you. They're like, this could be my wallet. Here you go. Like, I don't want this to happen to you. Oh my God, is this place real? It is real. They have almost no crime. It's an amazing place to live. Next, the reduction of honor culture epicenters. The problem in the hood is that if you're not in a gang, that gang beats that ass and takes your shit all the time. And you're going to want to respond because you're not a bitch. You're going to get a gat yourself and they're going to fuck around and find out. But you realize really quickly that you're just, you're just one guy with a gat. A gang has 10 people, and you kill one gang member, they're all coming after you. So at some point, you're like, well, I got to join a gang. And you join a gang, they beat you into the shit, and then you're not a victim anymore. Maybe you're a perpetrator, maybe you're more neutral, but at the very least, you're not getting punked out. And a lot of that need to respond with violence, to violence, comes from honor culture. Honor culture is a, a way of dealing with other people, specifically males in your society, in which there are people that are abusive. There are people that will take advantage of you. If they know they can just shit on you, they will, and you'll be a victim. But if you have a deeply held honor, you will not be wronged. And they know that, and you know that, they're much less likely to fuck around. The problem with honor culture is if someone tests you, you got to be for real about the response. You step on my Nikes. I'm beating you half to death in the 7-Eleven because everyone's going to find out I did this and then nobody's stepping on my fucking Nikes anymore. That kind of honor culture shit is because there's no Leviathan. There's no police force to enforce all of it. You got to stand up for yourself. That means everyone's got to be hard. That means everyone is more crime prone. If you reduce the power of honor cultures in their epicenters, then all of a sudden I don't have to stand up for myself. Like if I'm a Harry Potter ass looking kid and some mega mall super commercial 
place in a really elite suburb and someone tries to bully me, I don't have to beat them half to death and try to pull their jaw off their face so everyone can see how hard I am. I just got to be like, hey, man, I don't want any trouble. And then I just like go to the mall cop and be like, that guy just tried to take my soda. And the mall cop's like, come here, asshole. Fuck happened. And that person goes away because we have a recourse to an authority. We don't have to be violent anymore in the modern policed world. But there are parts of the world, the inner cities in the United States, where the degree of policing is very low, the degree of honor culture is very high, thus most of the violence comes from honor culture, gang on gang. If you eliminate gang on gang violence or gang on everyone else violence from American inner cities, you get to very, very low levels of violence. That's really the problem. The answer is you've got cops in there. Through my last video, you probably saw all the different ways to do policing well. And really with gang culture and, and honor culture, you just have to demonstrate to people, if you're a tough guy and you hurt other people, you're gone. And if you're not gone, the police are there talking to you real quick. And you realize that you don't have to defend yourself anymore, really, because if someone steps up to you, you're like, all right, see you when I call the police. And they're like, whoa, 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 hold on a sec. I don't want to go to jail. So if the cops reliably show up and take you to jail, if you fuck up, then all of a sudden, much more people are acting right. You don't have to have honor culture before. Now, honor culture is a culture. It's going to persist for years and even decades later. But if you reduce the crime massively and increase the police presence, honor culture you, loses its marginal utility. It's it actually a negative on average in utility. And at some point, there's new people coming into the culture, younger kids. They grow up and everyone they saw do honor culture is in jail now or dead. And they're like, I don't need this shit. And then they're like, well, you think you would need it, but the high crime in your community means you do need it. But there's no more high crime anymore because the police is there. There's low crime, and all the people who do on our culture, they're the only ones still doing the crime, and they're just filtering out of the population. At some point, you just get a sea change, especially generationally, and then it's not a problem anymore. Remember, all of us, every single culture on this earth had an ancestor culture probably not too long ago, the Japanese with the samurai in the 1800s, 1900s, that was an honor culture. And eventually they stopped doing honor culture because civility occurred through a, a top-down system of policing, which means everyone could be like, you know what? We just all agree not to do this shit anymore. I don't have to stand up for my my reputation because I don't need a reputation. I just need 911 and all y'all motherfuckers are fucked. So there's something to say to that. Another one, of course, is empowering the police to deter crime by higher rates of getting caught. Uh, if the if you know you're almost certainly getting caught for a crime, you're just not going to do a lot of crime that you otherwise would have if you were caught. So a big way to prevent crime is to let criminals know through experience that like this is does not going to work anymore. And it, a lot of this stuff is complex. It's worthy maybe of its own detailed discussion later. Let me know in the comments if you want me to talk about uh, the prevention of crime and uh, how that's done properly and improperly. Again, I'm not an expert on it. What I can do though is give you some insights on how prevention probably works really well. Skip the middle nuanced ground or talk about it and say, we don't really know yet. I at least don't know. And then talk about stuff that's a really bad idea because I'll tell you guys something else. One of the number one reasons that I decided to start this channel and talk Scott, the video guy into sitting through this bullshit is there are very many obvious good things we could be doing with social policy as a society that we don't a lot. And there are very many advocated and currently practiced things we do that are just terrible ideas, even to a lay person. And there's a lot of middle ground nuanced shit that scientists and criminologists need to talk about. I'm not interested in that middle shit. Neither are you. But that obvious shit we should be doing, I'm going to talk about it. And that obvious shit we shouldn't be doing, but are like defund the police, release all criminals from jail. I saw a fucking bumper sticker, of course, in L.A. was someone was like, uh, like, free all the prisoners, like, open up all the prisons. We're like, huh, you think that, but but you can't really think that. That person does. I'm here to get at that and be like, let's not do that. Let's do this good stuff. Next, imprisonment. Imprisonment has a dual function in how it reduces crime. One is as a deterrent to future crime. So it really is a preventative measure. Two is, and this is the topic of this lecture, as a literal removal of criminals from the population so that they are not present to commit crime. Seems like that would never work. We'll get back to that. Lastly, on ways to reduce crime is rehabilitation. Rehabilitation absolutely works to reduce crime, full stop. However, there are seven caveats to that. And as I read them off, you're going to be like, oh, God damn it, which is what when I did this research, I was like, oh, God damn it. Number one, rehabilitation works mostly on non-repeat criminals. 
You fuck up once or twice, your life's off to the wrong start or the wrong little ebb and flow. They get you through rehab. You're like, dude, what the fuck? Hell no, never again. If you're a repeat criminal, it doesn't work on you all that well. Number two, it works mostly when very intensely applied. If you think rehabilitation is you meet with like a prison um, chat group or a little, you know, a little drum circle, uh, AA type meeting once a week, that ain't it. It's got to be hours a day. You want to retrain your brain to think totally differently. Because if you have committed a crime, especially planned one, I'm like, yes, there's a good idea for me to rob this store. We got to get you thinking way different. Thinking way different means not an hour a day different. It means eight hours a day different for several years at a time. That is very expensive. It is very intricate. It works, but goddamn, it comes at a high price tag, at least for how much effort to put in. Number three, in its best cases, it's only marginally effective. So if you Google it, you ask, hey, like, you ask ChatGPT, does rehabilitation work? It goes, yes. But if you dig into the actual data, rehabilitation has usually marginal effects. It reduces recidivism by 5%, by 10%, by 15%. We're usually not talking about a rehabilitative measure that 10x or uh, multiplies the, uh, reduces the probability that some person will commit the same crime in the future by tenfold. Holy shit, that would be amazing. Sometimes that happens. It's very, very rare. Most rehabilitation is very marginal in its effects. And that's very important because of point number seven, I'll let you get to in a second. Point number four, in many cases, and this is kind of tragic, the effects of rehabilitation are short-lived. So some of the best studies proving rehabilitation works well measure outcomes a few months or a few years after the person has been rehabilitated. Studies that measure out longer and longer, a few years, several years, five to 10 years plus, usually you get higher rates of recidivism. So the effects of rehabilitation are usually more transient than we would want them to be, which kind of blows. Number five, this is the big kicker. Rehabilitation works the least, works the uh, most poorly on the most violent and hardened criminals. That is very important. I'll get to why in a bit. But the preview is these are the people that you want to get help with the most because they commit the vast majority of your crimes. They are the vast majority of problems and rehabilitation works on them the least poorly. Imagine you had an NBA team of just studs and you were looking at research practices from sports science to improve their basketball playing ability. But all the studies you've gotten together of what helps people, most of the studies show like, yeah, if you really suck at basketball, this actually helps a lot. These drills, ball handling, blah, blah, blah. But as you work with people that are more and more high level, these things work less and less well. And all of a sudden, if you're a coach of a pro team, you're like, fuck, oh, like it doesn't work for my guys. This sucks. And these are the guys I want it to work for. On the other end, if you've got hardened criminals, repeat offenders that commit the vast majority of nasty crimes and rehabilitation works the least on those people, when someone, when you say, well, we should be jailing people for longer and someone says, well, what about rehabilitation? You go, well, I wish it worked better for the very people we want it to work Number six, rehabilitation is becoming more and more effective over time because criminology researches rehabilitative practices and consistently iteratively improves them. What used to count as rehabilitation in the 60s, that doesn't work that great. Nowadays, we have much better methods of rehabilitation, but they're improving very, very slowly. And at least for now, uh, it's generally not very impressive in its effects. Coming back to point number three, it's still very marginal. So yes, it's getting better, but kind of not fast enough to really be this cudgel we could really use on a lot of stuff. And here's the kicker, number seven, the most important part. If you imprison someone for 20 years, that's 20 years of them not committing crimes by logical necessity because they're not around to do it. If you rehabilitate that same person in an alternate universe, and there is a probability of recidivism, the downsides of them, the rehabilitation not working are enormous. If someone murders again, R word, sexual assaults someone again, commits grand larceny again, that's a huge negative. But what is the huge negative of them being in prison to the rest of us? I don't know, like a price tag for how long it keeps, how much money we have to spend keeping them in prison? Yeah, holy shit. Would you pay a price tag on someone to sit somewhere in a comfortable prison cell because that person is likely to murder if they're outside of prison? Yes. Well, if someone's like, well, we can rehabilitate them. The next question you'd ask is, well, how good is the rehab? And they're like, honestly, for this person, 20 years, they're like not very good. So there's rehab. It works. 
very contextually. It's just underpowered. So we should be doing it as much as we can, but there's some shit it just doesn't do very well, at least for now. Now, backtrack. Why do people commit serious crimes? We, we want root cause stuff. We want to solve crime as much as we can. One of the ways we can find this out is you just interview criminals and you ask them what they say about it. Why do you commit crimes, Mr. Criminal? Almost always, when they're not lying, and it's very clear when they're lying, criminals will legitimately tell you that it's someone had something that they didn't and they simply took it, which could mean a life. Like, you, I don't think you should be alive anymore. Bang, stab, you're gone. I wanted this. I have it now. Sex. You have sex in there that I want. I'm going to get it out of you. I don't care what you say. I want it. Property. I want your TV. I feel like burning down your house. That's what I want to do. It's going to get done. Sociocultural, oppression narrative, that all stuff doesn't make any goddamn sense. Like, let's take the oppression narrative real quick. Fuck it. We'll go down that road. You would say some people on the political hard left in the United States, most reasonable people don't believe this, think that one of the reasons that some folks in the African-American community are more criminally prone is because of the effects of oppression by the Caucasian-American community. Got it. So why do they almost always commit crimes against people of their own race? Like if you're fighting the man, why don't you go fight the man? If you're like resisting together as a unified people against struggle that burdened you, which absolutely is also a thing, why are you hurting just people who live next door who are the same ethnicity? It doesn't add up because the percentage of crimes in the modern Western world, which can be attributed to sociocultural long-term struggles for oppression and power, is teeny tiny. The fraction of crimes in which someone's just like, I'm going to have that shit, click clack give me that shit, you say no, bang, is almost all serious crime. I just felt like that was what's going to happen. Deeper causes. Why do some people act like that? Most people don't act like that. Most people think like, if you're like, excuse me, ma'am, would you like to have sex with me? She's like, I'm good. Most people aren't like, is going to happen anyway, get ready. Most people are like, oh, that sucks. Move on to the next or go home and cry. Why are some people so insistent on getting what they want, regardless of its effects on others? I'm glad you asked. The vast majority of repeat violent criminals have antisocial personality disorder, ASPD. A huge fraction of the rest of violent repeat criminals are, if they don't have diagnosable ASPD, they are on the ASPD spectrum, which we're all on, very close to the cutoff, which means most violent repeat criminals have antisocial personality disorder or are close to that spectrum, which means they have a set of traits that means they don't give a shit about other people much, sometimes at all. They want what they want. They have crazy low impulse control. Like, I'm trying to have that now. I want it now. Click, clack. I'm going to get that shit now, etc. If you want to really look into something that will depress you, Google antisocial personality disorder. It's the real deal. Here's another couple of things. ASPD has a massive genetic component. We're not talking about race. Every race has people who have ASPD or on the spectrum very close to the cutoff. And those people, for their ethnic group or subgroup or familial group, there's just a huge genetic cause to having that, plain and simple. Treatment of ASPD. You can think like, well, can we treat these people? They have a disorder. Like attention deficit disorder is a thing we can treat it. Totally. This is directly from the empirical literature, so I will be quoting. My own words, the treatment of ASPD is very, very uphill. In the empirical literature, it has been described as being, quote, deeply ingrained and rigid in the scientific literature, which means they ain't not much to do about it. Quote from an, a review of the evidence on ASPD, relatively recent, Insufficient evidence exists to support any psychological intervention in adults with ASPD. That's bad news. In other words, they don't know how to help in any real major sense with people with ASPD. There's a couple things, a couple workarounds. Sometimes you give them some antidepressant medication to make them better. Sometimes antipsychotic because they just don't have the kind of moods they get into to hurt people. But really, it's a pretty intractable problem currently at the state of the science. What that means is there are some people in every subculture of society 
who are very close to that ASBD cutoff, and because it's an arbitrary cutoff, we'll just call them just genetically much more antisocial personality having. And they are way overrepresented in the people that commit crimes all the time, especially serious crimes. That is some gnarly reality. It's going to come in handy in a bit. Now that we know, okay, this is really what causes a lot of violent crime is really just people with antisocial personality disorder are totally uncontrolled and are out there in the world. Let's ask, what would be the function of imprisoning them if they commit crimes? People who commit crimes, what is the function of imprisonment? First, one of them is the idea of retribution. Revenge is a better term for it. Here's the thing. So basically someone kills someone and you want them away because how dare you kill someone? They should deserve to be in prison. I had a problem with that. Here's the thing. What already, what happened already happened. You can't undo time. No one's bringing that person back that was hurt. No one's bringing that property back. Them sitting in prison isn't going to do that. The impulse you feel for revenge and for personal justice is biological. It is an animal impulse. It predates modern police society. It's from the honor culture days where it made excellent game theoretic sense. You take from me, you hurt me, you hurt mine. I take from you back, I hurt you back so that you know next time not to fuck with me. That is the logic of tit for tat. So if someone killed or hurt someone, they ask better be in prison having a bad time for a long time because I want people in the future to know that's what they can expect. We don't want revenge. We want less future crime. So yes, it's cool to want revenge, but you don't want revenge because you understand that revenge is nonsense. That harm has already been done. There's nothing you can do to bring back the harm and un undo the hurt. What you can do is have a policy that makes the probability of that person or of anyone else doing bad things in the future. That's what we can, some of us will be into revenge and I hear you. There's a lot going there. Fuck these goddamn criminals. I feel that. And there's a, there's a correct way to, to feel that. Some of you will be like, dude, revenge is pointless and stupid and it's heinous and it's immature. And you're absolutely totally right also. But what we all agree on, we can take the revenge thing and just dump it. We don't need it. Hold on a sec. Because if we can't get agreement on it, no big deal. We don't need it. We need agreement on just one thing. We already have it. How do we architect our punishment system in society to have the consensus of what all groups want, which is less crime? And you got a group or a person that wants more crime, that'd be fun to talk to them because that doesn't make any goddamn sense. Because again, if you're pro-crime, I'm going to have a discussion with you. And then in the middle of that discussion, I'll just get up and slap you across the face. What the fuck are you going to do about it? You're pro-crime, right? So get at me. Let's do some crime to each other. You like crime. I like crime. All of a sudden, bad things happen. If you're a logical individual, you are anti-crime. And because we all want future crime to go down, how do we construct our prison system to reduce future crime? Here's the thing. The primary function of imprisonment, it turns out, is the utility of criminal removal. That's the number one reason prisons work. It is by far the biggest benefit of imprisonment to crime reduction. It is simply the removal of criminals from the free population. What's the logic here? There are criminals, they commit crimes. If you take a lot of them out and put them in jail, the number of people left over to commit crimes is much smaller and you get fewer crimes. Hold up. How can this be? Aren't there like millions of people committing crimes all the time? How can removing even thousands of them even thousands of them make a possible dent into crime that seems like nonsense. But it's not nonsense. And here's the point of why criminal removal works so well. Because of the repeat offender phenomenon. What the hell is that? The vast majority of serious, especially violent criminals, are repeat criminals. The vast majority of serious crimes are committed by these perpetually repetitive criminals. A huge fraction, thus, of serious crime is committed by a very small number of repeat offenders. Small enough that in most communities in the United States, the police officers know them by name. So much so that on a lower scale, this works on every scale of crime, 
thousands of instances of shoplifting in Manhattan, this was recently published, you can Google this, were attributed to something like several hundred shoplifters who would be arrested, sent to jail for a day, we got nothing for you, sent back, and they're back on the street. The same literal people did the vast majority, something like 95% of all shoplifting in Manhattan. Holy shit, how does that work? Because the vast majority of people that are repeat criminals do the vast majority of the crime. Getting these literal people off the streets has been shown time and time again empirically to reduce crimes by immense margins because they're real people and they're out there. And letting them roam free has been shown empirically over and over again in the literature to keep crime very high. Often, the way this literature is conducted, you just directly track criminals that you release back into the population and see how much crime they do. And you see how much crime they did before. And you get a lot of really interesting, sometimes very sad data. In the last few years, the Los Angeles various police districts have been releasing a lot of criminals from their jails into the wild because their prison population is, is too much, too many prisoners. It's an interesting way to think about it because really you would ask the question of like, is that a good thing because they're not in a public sphere or is that a bad thing because there's some kind of injustice? I think a lot of left-leaning people in LA jurisdictions really just assumed it was injustice, let a bunch of prisoners go where they sort of catch and release them. Like you did a bad crime, here's a couple days in jail and you go back out. And they've shown that literally the same people, often with 9, 10, 11, 15, 20 plus prior offenses, keep coming back for heinous crimes. Same people all the time. If you get them off the street, there's not actually that many of them. And you can find almost all of them. So with that in mind, that it's repeat offenders that do most of the serious crime, there is a huge value that emerges of escalating prison terms for repeat offenders. What does that mean? We know some very valuable things. Most people who commit a single crime will not commit another crime ever. Most criminals are one-time people. You have a fucking drunk driving incident or some shit. You just got too sloshed. You weren't thinking right. You got handsy with someone when you were 18 and it was really like feisty and it was a fight outside of a party. Some shit like that. That's most crimes numerically. And most people will commit one. Most people commit no crimes. And then a huge fraction of people commit one crime and they're like, you never again. And it never happens. Most people who commit non-serious crimes misdemeanors, et cetera, are also not very likely to ever commit serious crimes. Fraction of people that do misdemeanors is enormous. The fraction of people that do murders is very high. Almost all murderers are people who used to do misdemeanors, but almost all misdemeanor people never make it to murder. We don't really have to club the shit out of misdemeanor people, but we do know that some of them in there are worth finding. Here's that point. Repeat offenders are the worst criminals. Most of them start their crime trends in late childhood, early teen years, when they almost certainly are revealed to have antisocial personality disorder. Not to you know laugh about it, but like it's kind of that straightforward in many cases. And most people who commit a high number of crimes climb in the seriousness of offense of their crime. If you're doing, there's almost no one out there that's doing like 20 low-level misdemeanors and just never got above that. There's a lot of people doing one, two, or three misdemeanors and then just not doing anything after, or they do one of those every decade. But there's also a small fraction of people that commit five, 10, et cetera, misdemeanors, and then they start getting into low-level uh, felonies and then high-level felonies. So at some point, when you are a career criminal, you're on a track that usually goes up. With enough repetition, we can confidently state, on average, statistically, you're likely to keep fucking up and worse. Thus. My contention is this, if someone commits a non-serious crime or less serious crime, non-serious is kind of absurd, once or even a few times, we should try to avoid imprisoning them to, uh, altogether in most cases. Or we keep the sentences very minor and levy rehabilitation much more. Fuck prison, put them into some kind of rehab center. But we should be very clear in warning them probably during rehab or whatever kind of punishment they received, that future crimes will be much more heavily punished. There's a very big difference between getting a slap on the wrist 
and next and, and told next time you do this, you get another slap on the wrist or it's implicitly understood that that's what happens versus, and I'll use the physical contact analogy. I don't literally mean this. You get a slap on the wrist and the cop says, look, I did this to you this time. The next time you do this kind of crime, I'm going to baton break your fucking hand. You're like, holy shit. Now, I don't think cops should be out there breaking hands. That's for the criminal justice system to do for imprisonment. We don't should be hurting people to commit crimes. But by analogy, if you understand the next offense is like, look, you got a slap on the wrist, which means we gave you a ticket. The next time you do the same crime is five years in prison. You're like, wait, what? Okay, nah. But if you know the next time you do this, you just get another ticket and then another ticket and then another ticket and then nothing ever happens. What's to stop you from doing it? Nothing at all. And it's totally cool because whatever, misdemeanors should deserve tickets. But we know that repeat offenders are on a track probabilistically to go to do very bad things. So for them, we have to cut them off right there. So for reasonable people that sometimes fuck up are told, look, you do this again, bad things happen. Most of them won't do it again because they weren't even on track to do it again. They just screwed up. But if you're on track to doing some shit by being a repeat offender, not only should you know you're into some bullshit later, but you should be levied heavy, heavy shit. So if someone commits a crime, a very serious crime or any sort of crime multiple times, they can be given much more prison time very justly because everyone was warned and we're not we're living in some weird totalitarian super uh, uh, society where everyone goes to jail for spitting gum on the street. Like Singapore is dope and all, but fuck that. That's crazy. I don't think anybody wants that. But if you're a serious for real for a criminal or well on your way, we don't want you around anymore. As an example. We can do the following with offenses. I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to read through this really quick. Guys, I don't mean these things literally. This is just food for thought for you. It's the pattern I want you guys to see, not any of the exact things. For example, nonviolent but harmful offenses. Things like burglary, grand theft, carrying an illegal gun, things like that. First offense, again, just an example, just to illustrate the spirit of the matter. Maybe no prison time. Maybe just community service, maybe a fine, maybe counseling, maybe support. Second offense, long-term prison, five to 10 years, you're gone. So you carry an illegal gun once, all right. You don't have any, uh, you know, there's a very, very big difference between carrying a legal gun because you bought it legally, you have no criminal record, you forgot to file for your permit properly versus like you're a gangster and you got an illegal gun for what we all know is obvious shit. But if you're a gangster and it's the second time you're caught with an illegal gun, and we know it's bad news, five to 10 years in jail. And because you know that, there's not really an excuse. Folks, illegal guns don't just magically appear on your person or in your vehicle. That's all like you knew the shit was happening. Third offense, something like 15 to 20 years in prison. That's right. You go on for a long time. Fourth offense. Think about this for a second because this is going to sound fucked up. Fourth offense, life in prison. Hold on. What? Life in prison for burglary? Mm-hmm. Why? Because it's your fourth offense. You burgled, that's a word, three other times. And the last time you did it, you were in jail for 12 years. You got out and what did you do again? You stole some shit. Now, either there's some kind of grand conspiracy to set you up for all these crimes, which is total first-rate bullshit, or you can't stop taking other people's shit. Guess what? If four fucking times you can't stop taking other people or, hey, listen, you're a hardcore conservative anti-crime, we'll call it E3 or two. If you're a bleeding heart leftist, no big deal. I agree with a bunch of what you're saying. Six or seven. But at some point, you keep committing the same type of crime. And if it's getting worse, you're gone. Gone, gone. Life in prison. You live somewhere else because you can't play in the sandbox well with everyone else. Term I caught from my wife. You just don't play around well. And you've shown us as definitively as anyone with eyes can see, you are not going to be in society. We take you out. Life in prison. Grand theft. It's your fifth car that you stole. You don't get to live with the rest of society anymore. You've been carrying a legal gun. It's your sixth offense. Fucking kidding me? What do we think you're going to do with that gun? It's quite obvious at this point. Next, an example for the same kind of tier system for violent offenses. I think murder, murder one, 
uh, and uh, violent R-word, uh, sexual assault, uh, probably should carry instant life sen uh, sentences if the overwhelming evidence convicts you of the crime. So that aside, an example of this uh, ex uh, of category of crime would be like domestic battery, um, fist fights over road rage, things like that. First offense, short prison time, less than five years, heavy rehab, heavy counseling, all that stuff. I get it. Like, you might need to do some prison time to keep people around you feeling safe, but we don't want to lock you up for the rest of your life. You know, like, maybe you had some shit going on. We all lose our temper and you, you know, beat some guy's ass because you cut you off in traffic. I'm not trying to defend it, but like, look, maybe it's not a life prison type of thing. Second offense. Guys, I want to be very clear about my position on this matter. I think everyone is flawed. I think everyone does bad things. But if you do two bad things of the same thing in a row, like you get in a fist fight once in traffic, dope, we all have a fucking Tuesday. You get fist fight twice in traffic. What the fuck? Even though you went to five years jail before for that, you get out and two years later, you in another fucking knuckle brawl when there's a green light and you thought it was red with someone who also is a piece of shit and got out of their car to try to fight you. Much longer prison time, 15 to 20 years, because again, you demonstrated you cannot act right. Third offense, life in prison. You beat your girlfriend's ass once, five years in jail. It's fucked up. I think you should be going away for forever, but I'm just having a lot of feelings about it. I don't know, bitch had it coming. Whatever. Fuck it. She tried to throw some shit at you and you beat that ass. Fine. Second time, maybe she's the psycho. Different girlfriend now. Maybe she also beat that ass. She just didn't go for it because her marks didn't land because you're fucking juking that shit. All right. But you beating that ass a second time. I don't want you around. At the very least, I'll make a claim. You're probably beating your girlfriend because you are in your peak reproductive years as a male, age 15 to 35. You get caught beating that girlfriend the third time when you're 21 years old for the rest of your testosterone producing years, peak male years in which you're violent. Apparently, I don't want you around. 15 to 20 years, you're in prison, you're gone. And lastly, the third time you beat your girlfriend up, new girlfriend, wife or some shit. Nope. We don't want people like you in our society. People like you. Well, like who? Everyone screws up. Does everyone screw up three times? It's not a screw up anymore. That's a pattern of behavior. It's something that is zigged in your brain that should have zagged. You ain't right. And until we can fix your ass, you live somewhere the fuck else away from girlfriends. Period. Full stop. Because it's cool to be pro-criminal justice and criminal reform and criminals' rights, and I get it and I love it, but a much more solid position, if we're going to take antithetical position to each other, is, is I'm for the victim. And I don't want any woman walking around thinking a guy could beat my ass and just be back on the street. Fuck that. You want to live in a world like that? I, I assume that you don't. The theme of this proposal, the general theme I'm trying to say here, is everyone fucks up once or twice. We shouldn't be putting people away at all or long for it. But the people that fuck up over and over are likely to keep doing it and with worse and worse crimes, are a hugely disproportionate danger to the rest of us, and should not be around in civil society. Now, given that that's the case, what should the prison experience be like? If they're not around the rest of us, should we just be locking them up anywhere in some fucking dungeon and throwing away the key? Here's the thing. Retribution doesn't need to be a factor at all because remember, revenge is a myth. We don't need it. And revenge, oh, sorry, uh, retributive justice, especially making prisons really bad, doesn't actually seem to have a very big empirical effect on crime. The number one effect is probability of being caught, deterrence-wise. If the prison sentence is really nasty, but I probably won't get caught, I'm doing that shit. Even if the prison sentence isn't very nasty, if I know I'm almost certainly going to get caught, it seems even criminals think about it once or twice extra. The prison experience itself, whether or not the prisons are total shit or they're actually really great places, as long as there's a high probability of getting caught and you go away for a long time, the deterrence effect is very, very similar. In addition to that, people can be falsely imprisoned. And then really harsh prison conditions are like especially fucked up. You're imprisoned falsely or the laws are just weird. We don't have all the answers, right? We used to imprison people for being gay and weird shit like that. Like, fuck, glad we don't do that anymore. We don't know if we have it all figured out. So anytime we're putting someone in prison, it's a very educated guess about that they should be in prison. We can guess wrong in many ways. The crime could be wrong. It shouldn't be even a crime to do what they're doing. Or we got the wrong guy. And so having prison conditions that are really nasty, there's no recourse for those kinds of people. It's just tragedy at that point. And some would say, I don't really think this that much, 
But I understand the people who say this, so I'm regurgitating their views. Even hardcore criminals that are just predators, they're still human in, in their own way. And, and maybe nobody deserves what's essentially long-term torture. Like if a wolf kills your dog, do you shoot it on sight? Maybe, but it's also a wolf. It's out, that's what it does all the time. This is it. And it's kind of beautiful in its own way. Maybe criminals are just people who are just like raw, real cavemen type motherfuckers. And they even have some benefits and they can have a good life just the fuck away from the rest of us. You may be of that opinion. So for that reason, because the downside is very small and the upside is notable, I think that my personal view is that prison should be incredibly comfortable and have near zero intimidation, sexual assault, etc. What do I mean? Just a couple of examples for you. Wi-Fi with full media access, good food, good health care, comfortable rooms and beds with plenty of space, humanity from the prison staff. The prison staff should not treat you like an animal. They treat you like a human being. They treat you well. They are service providers to you. Lots of facilities to exercise, to be outside. No more holding people in prisons where you don't see the sun. It's fucking nuts. That is inhuman. And why not let them exercise? Let them exercise. Sometimes people say like, well, these prisoners train with weights and they come out and they're stronger than the cops. Dope. That's why you have jujitsu training as a cop and your fucking gun. Shoot them motherfuckers dead. Someone starts swinging at you in the street. You're a cop. You warn them a couple times, drop them. Happens all the time. Not a, a, a not concern. But it turns out weight training and other exercise can help prisoners get a lot of that bullshit out. And then they become significantly less violent in the hours and days after, which is a really awesome thing. It also teaches them how to be organized and teaches them lessons of put in the work here. Good things happen. Builds camaraderie. All that good stuff. Making prisoners are sort of less human than the rest of us, super violent people. You don't want to put them in a condition that dehumanizes them further. You want to put them in a condition that at least salvages as much of their humanity as possible. We should make huge efforts in prison design and in systems architecture to limit incidents of violence and intimidation between inmates. That's never okay. You should never be sexually assaulted in prison. No one should ever punk you out. Everything should be on camera. And if you're being a bully, you go to be somewhere else by yourself. That means some people won't be in prison population. They'll be in more or less isolation all the time. And that's tragic. But at the same time, it's much more tragic that they get to interact with other people and give them a hard time. A huge thing of mine is we should never, ever, ever mix violent and nonviolent offenders. There should not be a world in which my cellmate is there for murder one or there for, you know, manslaughter and I'm there for, you know, uh, tax fraud or some shit like that. Holy crap. I'm there because I doubt marijuana. Oh my God. Like it's always tragic when that happens. Those are two very different kinds of people, both not on their best behavior, but one thing is just way out of proportion. Access to the latest experimental rehabilitative therapy. We should be experimenting with good faith efforts to rehabilitate these people as a huge fraction of the prison spending we do to try to find out how to rehab them better. Big ROI there if we discover some good methods. And I would say at least an opportunity for productive work to generate wealth and value for the rest of society and to offset their own prison costs. Maybe even in some cases when they're capable of doing it, mandatory work. You should have to work. Prison shouldn't be around. You're sitting around all the time. There are many ways we can get prisoners to do productive jobs, and that's probably a good idea to get them to do that. Now, there are drawbacks to this. One drawback is it's really fucked up. Someone who killed your friend or your relative now gets three hot meals a day, snacks, and Wi-Fi. That's really insane. But here's the thing. No amount of torturing them will ever bring your relative back. It is very easy for me to say this sitting it here. It is much harder to live with in real life but it's still true. And we should design policy not based on retributive emotions, but based on logic. Now, this kind of imprisonment might cost double what current imprisonment costs, which is a big deal. But that cost can be almost wholly offset by having most prisoners do productive work. Like prisoners can easily do enough productive work to pay for most of their living expenses. And all of a sudden it's like, holy shit, this is totally great. And here's the kicker. The cost savings to society of the vast majority of violent and serious offenders being gone off the street is massive. Imagine LA, Chicago, Detroit, where 97% of the gang members simply disappear in a few years because they're all convicted. They're all 18 time offenders. They're gone. All life prison, life in prison, life in prison, life in prison, just gone. And the new gang members that take their place also disappear regularly as they come up. Having 97% of fewer of those people around is such an enormous cost savings 
it would radically transform civil society. It would be one of the greatest things we ever did. That cost savings in dollars from business profitability in human lives of people being able to walk their dogs outside and wave to their neighbors is incalculably high and way outprices the prison cost by a long time. So any, anytime people say we spend too much money on prisons, to me, that's an insane proposition to talk about. Last thing, the main thrust, violent and serious crime is one of the worst possible things that we have to deal with in society. Terrible prison conditions are also insanely inhumane and fucking awful. We can reduce both massively by scaling imprisonment time to the seriousness and repetition of the offense and by making prisons way more hospitable. This action is incredibly well aligned with the reality of who commits most crime which is that repeat offenders do a huge fraction of all serious crime, and they're not that hard to find. Thus, it will bring crime rates down by an order of magnitude or more if we are serious about it. And compassionate people, like many of you and myself, can feel way better about sending criminals to prison because prison is just night and day from what it used to. You don't believe me that prison can be like this? Google Swedish prison, Danish prison, Finnish prison. Shit doesn't look like prison. It's wild. There's not even handlebars. People just walk around. It's the weirdest thing in the world, but it works to keep those people the fuck away from the rest of society, which is the number one act of prison. Here's what I say, and I'll leave you with this, a bit of an emotional appeal. No more hardened criminals in the streets. No more. No more ghetto crime wastelands. No more gangs. No more dead kids in drive-by. Fuck that. Fuck crime. And if you're pro-crime, fuck you. I'm kidding. That last part was a bit combative. In any case, let me know what you guys think, and I'll see you next time.